If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We are walking through the book of Matthew. Uh, if you're a guest here with us today and we go verse by verse and line by line and we thank the Lord uh, for that. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along and take a few notes, uh, you're welcome to do that also. Today I want to talk to you about overcoming temptation. Overcoming temptation. This applies to ever living, breathing human being in life. We are going to be tempted. It's a matter of when and how long. All right, temptation is out there. That's Satan's job. That's what he loves to do. And we need to be ready for his attacks. If you look in your bulletin, the outline is this, overcoming temptation. Number one, the first temptation. The first. Notice he doesn't give up after one time. The second temptation. And then the third temptation. And you have to understand, if he tempts Jesus, then he will surely tempt us. So we need to be ready. And the thing you have to do is you have to be, have to be able to recognize this is a temptation. This is not from God. You know, it's amazing how fast things can change in your life. Jesus went from being uh, from Jesus went from his holy and spiritual high blessing of being baptized to the challenging times of testing in his life as he began his public ministry. It was no surprise to Jesus because the devil has been tempting mankind since the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden. Jesus is about to prove he is worthy to receive and to reign over the kingdom of his heavenly Father. Jesus consistently lived in perfect harmony with God's divine plan. And folks, God has a divine plan for every one of you that are here. We as Christians should be encouraged by Jesus' example of how to overcome temptation in our own lives. Let's study this wonderful scripture together, and let's begin with Hebrews chapter 4, and I want to read verses 14 through 16, which will tell us that uh, it is not a sin to be tempted, okay? Temptation is, is coming. Hebrews 4, verse 14, See, and then we have a great high priest. Who is our high priest? Jesus Christ. He is our, our mediator. He is God's son. Uh, in this case, he was God in human flesh on the earth who has passed through the heavens. Folks, he's been in heaven. He came down and lived a perfect life and died on a cross for our sins and was risen to show victory uh, over death. But then he went back to heaven. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. And that is our confession of faith, or we call it profession of faith. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. God sent Jesus down here. He was 100% God, but here's what we lose sight of. He was 100% man also. If you pinched him, it hurt. He hungered. He, had, he got tired. You see, he was man also, who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but in all points tempted as we are. And folks, he was tempted. I am telling you, uh, the, 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 the Bible verses that we will read in Matthew are just amazing because Satan himself, after the baptism, came after Jesus first. And we can see, folks, if he'll come after Jesus, we know he'll come after us. Was in all points tempted as we are, and here's the difference, yet without sin. And the bottom line, and you're going to hear me say this throughout the sermon, the difference between us and Jesus is we think about temptation. And when we start thinking about it, we have lost half of the battle. When temptation came to Jesus, boom, he said, no, nope, I'm not doing it. There's no way. I've been sent here to do a job. I've got something that I need to do. Nothing's going to keep me from being the lamb of God, the perfect Lamb of God. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. And this gives us another hint. Folks, the key is prayer. 
prayer. We should pray at least five times a day. You say, ooh, you're a fanatic, aren't you? Not at all. I'm trying to help you folks. We should pray when our day starts. God, help me to live for you today. God, help me not to fall to temptation. Then if you eat three meals, you ought to bless every meal. Doesn't matter where you're at. Bless your meal. God provided. And then I believe the last one is the the one, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That last prayer is the key to being right with God. So we need to pray. Come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we need to understand Jesus is there. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is our example. Jesus is everything to us. So let's see these three things. The first temptation, Matthew 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit. That is a key right there. He he listened to his Father. He was in communion with his Father. He was, uh, you know, obeying his Father. He was doing everything God wanted him to do. And you can see that is important. Folks, we as Christians need to do the same thing. And we need to be filled with the Spirit. And to be filled with the Spirit, you have to have the Word of God in you, which I'm, uh, I'm going to show you here in just a few minutes. So the first key is be filled with the Spirit. And he led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Why the wilderness? Because he would have been alone. Just Satan in Jesus. You know what Satan loves to do? Isolate you. He likes to get you by yourself. He wants you to feel sorry for yourself. He wants you to think you're the only one in life going through this. And I'm not trying to, you know, you know, act like these problems aren't big. But folks, I, our God is bigger than our problem. And he sent him to the wilderness and Jesus was in the wilderness, and it's not like our wilderness, okay? All right, back in those days, I'm talking wild animals, animals that would attack you, uh, animals that survive uh, on meat and all these things going on, to be tempted by the devil. And let me say this, and I don't say this lightly, you probably have never been tempted by the devil. Why? Because the devil can only be at one place at one time. If he's in Europe, which overseas, I think he hangs out there a lot. Okay? I'm not picking on the countries. I'm just saying he is doing a work overseas. You look at Israel, you look at all that's going over there. What he has is thousands upon thousands of demons. And those are the ones that get after us. Okay? I'm not saying you haven't. I'm just saying most likely you haven't because when Satan strikes, folks, it is obvious. It is obvious. And he to be tempted by the devil. Look at verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and again, fasted is, fasted is a word we've kind of lost in Christendom now. And fasting is not trying to lose weight. That is not what the purpose of fasting is, although it does help you do that. I will say that. But I'm saying fasting is for the purpose of tuning into God to where you would spend the time that you would spend eating, you would spend with God. And most Americans eat three meals a day. So that means literally, instead of having three meals a day, when your lunch comes around, you would spend time with God in isolation somewhere. Okay? So he is fasting. 40 days. Hey, do the math, folks. That's longer than a month. Longer than a month without food. I fasted one time for five days and thought I was going to die. Okay? Why? Because I'm so dependent on food. I admit it, folks, I would be a poster boy for that. But I'm simply saying, Jesus knew what was going to take place. He knew who Satan was. He knew that this was going to be the greatest challenge other than the cross in his life. 
So he spent 40 days praying and fasting and 40 nights. Afterward, he was hungry. Now that's, that, that's not hard to figure out. Why? Because he was a human. Okay, he ate food just like we ate food. We eat food. So he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, and by the way, he hits you when you're most vulnerable. He takes advantage of you. And you say, well, how does he know he can't read minds? He can't read your minds, but we don't close our mouth that often. Let me help you today. Don't make this statement. Well, what else could happen to me? You are throwing him a bone, folks. Now, when the tempter came to him, he said, if, notice three times he uses the word if. What does if mean? It tosses doubt in your mind. It's saying, I'm not sure you can do this, but if you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made into bread. Well, the issue was not, could he do that? Folks, he was Jesus. He could do that. But Jesus was trying to explain to him in, in the scripture that follows is, folks, everybody gets hungry, all right? But I must do the will of the Father. See, this is the key, folks. This is the key. Being in the perfect will of God. And what he is saying is, Jesus was trying to tell them that God is my provision. Folks, the food you, you will set down today, God gave you that food. Your bank account that buys that food, God gave you that. And so it was a temptation to Jesus and if you look at the miracles, he never did miracles just to show off. He didn't do it. He did miracles so that he could share a spiritual reason and spiritual things with others. So what does he do? But he, Jesus, answered and said, it is written. There's the key. Know the word of God. Know the word of God. If you don't read it, you won't know it. If you don't study it, you won't know it. That's why I have two devotions that I do. I do one in the morning when I get up, and I do one when I go to bed. I want to start the day with Jesus and his word, and I want to end the day with Jesus and his word. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. What is Jesus saying? He is saying that in our spiritual life, we need to be more concerned about the Word of God than what we eat. Boy, now you're getting personal, Lord. Because <laughs> what is the first thing? If you're like me, the first thing you do when you wake up, you think, what am I having for breakfast? So this really does go against, and I'm not saying you should go days and days and days without eating. Your motive is very important in fasting. I'm simply saying Jesus was not going to do this miracle basically because Satan said, you know, I, I don't believe you can do it. All right? Jesus was making a very, very important uh, 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 thing here. Uh, Hebrews 4.12. Look at Hebrews 4.12. Go with me to Hebrews 4.12. Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is living... I don't know how somebody can read the Word of God and say, man, that's boring. Are you kidding me? The Word of God is alive. It is powerful. It'll make a drunk man saved, folks. It'll get people off addictions. It'll save marriages. It will give you, give you abundant life. The Word of God should be your most important, the, the most important book in your library that you read. The Word of God is powerful, it's sharper than any two edged sword. Why do you need a sword to fight with in those days? Folks, we're fighting Satan and his demons every day. And, and if you look at the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So he's saying, you folks that just read your Bible occasionally, that's why you're losing when it comes to temptation. 
You must spend time in the Word. Two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thought and intents of the heart. Folk, I'm telling you the gospel truth. The more of the word of God you get in your life, the closer you're going to get to God. Satan doesn't want you reading your Bible. Satan doesn't want, does not want you praying. Satan does, doesn't want you to have discernment. So the Word of God is huge, and that's why Jesus is saying that, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Folks, we need to hide the Word of God in our heads and in our hearts. It is so important also to memorize Scripture. Memorize it. You know why? Because when we're tempted, it's in all kinds of ways and all kinds of places. And we don't have time to say, oh, wait wait a minute, devil, let me go get my Bible. Why? Because he's already attacking, folks. And if we have the word in our hearts, when we start to say the word, things turn towards Christ. Romans 6, 1 and 2, what shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how how can I, who am dead to sin, live any longer therein? What shall we say then? Shall I continue to steal? Should I continue to lie? Should I take this? Should I do this? If it's a sin, God forbid. And the thing about our mind is we can't think two, two things at the same time. If I am concentrated on God, if I'm thinking about the Word of God, that temptation goes away. So we see what Jesus was doing here. Matter of fact, in John, he said it. John chapter 4. And if you just read this, you know, uh, for what it is at first, you would just think, what is he talking about? John 4, verse 31. And, And it says, it says, in the meantime, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat. And you remember, he, uh, he left the woman at the well. Uh, he came back and he, they went for food while they were out. Verse 32, but he said, I have food to eat of which you do not know. He was not worried about food, folks. He was worried about that lady's soul. It was a divine appointment. He was going to lead that lady to Christ. He could care less what they were having for lunch. Verse 33, therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? <laughs> what, are they, what, what are they thinking? Man, somebody got him some food. That's why he's, he's not hungry. But this is, look at this. Jesus said to them, my food is due to do the will of God. Folks, the will of God is more important than eating. The will of God to him who sent me and to finish his work. So Jesus, in the first temptation, simply said, nope, I'm not falling for that one. I will not make uh, these stones in the bread, even though I could, but I am following the will of God. I am trusting God. I am trusting in his timing, and you're not going to get me on that one. The second one, the second temptation is found in verse 5. The devil took him up to the holy city, of course we know that's Jerusalem, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And if he's on the eastern side, eastern side it's the highest peak there. And it's around 450 feet, okay? Matter of fact, if you read on about James later on, the the pastor at Jerusalem church, that's where the scribes and Pharisees chucked him off of it and killed him. I mean, if you go down, uh, you are going to die. And it says, and he said to him, if, notice the word, you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. So we see uh, you know, the second temptation. And, and by the way, Satan never quits after the first one, folks. If you pass the first test, you better get ready for another one. And he was basically telling him, Jesus, if you will jump off, it'll prove that you are the son of God, because we know God's not going to let you die. So what was the temptation? It wasn't to trust God, okay? It was to challenge God to see 
if he would do this. And folks, I am telling you, Jesus was smarter than that. Jesus knew that if he chose to do that, it would happen. But Jesus knew he did not have to prove it to Satan. He did not have to have his approval. It was almost like he would be tempting God. And that is what he's saying here. And notice something else on the second one. He was quoting Scripture. Did you know Satan can quote Scripture? Think about it. He can. But you notice something? If you look at it carefully, he left a whole sentence out. A whole sentence. Folks, Satan can give you just enough Scripture to mess you up. Do you realize every word uh, that, that comes from the Word of God is important? Do you realize a not in OT can change the whole meaning of a sentence? And Satan will misquote Scripture. Okay? Here, he didn't misquote. Well, he did misquote it because he took part of it out. And, and the part out is between these two sayings here. He shall give you angels charged over you, but he left out to keep you in all your ways. That would be like me saying, you know, uh, I've got a sign from God that I'm going to live till I'm 72 years old. Well, prove it to us. That'd be like me saying, I'm going to go out on 71 and I'm going to throw myself in front of a truck. Are you, <laughs> folks, surely we're not that silly. That is tempting God. And we can't do that. And Satan was thinking, surely God would save him. And Jesus was saying, again, I am not messing with the will of God. Jesus knew what his purpose was. Jesus knew from the time he left heaven that he came to die on the cross. And he wasn't going to shorten that because Satan was testing him or challenging him. But the, the deal about the Scripture is to keep you in all your ways. Folks, I am telling you, we must stay with the Word of God. Satan left that out. Yes, we're under the divine protection of God. But we don't put ourselves in harm's way and tempt God. We just shouldn't take chances like that. Just being smart about that. And then he quotes the rest of the scripture. In their hands, they shall bear you up unless you dash uh, on your foot against the stone. Matter of fact, the song that I remember, uh, and man, we used to sing it all the time. I'm talking a long time ago. He could have called 10,000 angels. Folks, he could have jumped off there and been fine. But it was showing dependence on himself and not dependence on God. Folks, be careful what you do. Be careful that what you pray and what you think you hear praying lines up with truth and lines up with the Word of God. Okay? And that's so, so important. Second Timothy well, let, hold on, let's finish, finish verse 7. And Jesus said unto him, it is written again. What does he do? Quoting the Bible again. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And we know he's quoting Deuteronomy 6, 16. We know in the first one, I forgot to tell you, he was quoting Deuteronomy 8, 3 about uh, the word and, and the bread and all that is going on. Another thing here is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Folks, I am telling you that, you know, uh, we should not put ourselves in harm's way. 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3. Man, I love this. Verse 14. But you must continue. You know, it could have said you, you must continue. All right? It, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing them from whom you've learned them, and from the childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Jesus Christ. I thank God for Vacation Bible School. I thank God, now I'm going to date myself, for sunbeams. I thank God for discipleship training. All these places... When I was a child, when I was a kid, they were pouring the Word of God in me. 
Even in, I remember one Bible school, uh, we got a big prize if we memorized Psalms 100. And I think it had to do with candy, if I remember right. And do you not think Mike Franklin didn't memorize that for candy? All right. Anyway, you can get it in, folks, all right? And again, I'm not promoting bribing people for that. I'm simply saying the Word of God changes people. The Word of God, and when we can memorize, we can do battle. We can do battle. Now look at verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. Folks, doctrine is what we believe. For, uh, for reproof and correction. It is what we have to be, watch for. Okay, the, the thou shalt not in the Old Testament. We need to be corrected at times from the Word of God. For instruction in righteousness, how to be right with God, how to live righteously, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Oh, folks, you have to understand the Word of God is your lifeline. Your lifeline. You need to cherish the Word of God. You need to hold on to the Word of God. You need to clutch it. And just hold on. And when you read it, you need to finish the Word of God with God. Thank you for your written Word. Thank you for speaking to me uh, uh, through the Word of God. And you know what our problem is, folks? We are too busy in our lives. And let me say this. If you are too busy to read the Bible, you are too busy. Something needs to change. We need the Word of God. The last thing, the third temptation, verse 8. And again, the devil took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And again, how that took place, you know, uh, you know what mountain they're talking about, uh, there's not a description, but it obviously was the high place where they could look out for miles. And it said, and he said to them, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. All right, folks, I am telling you, the first commandment is thou shalt have no other gods before you. Folks, God is number one in our lives. You know what's crazy? Jesus was going to get it anyway. Folks, he, he's going to, I'm telling you, he's going to come back. He's going to reign from Jerusalem. He is going to reign for 1,000 years. And so that would already take place. But to fall down and worship Satan, folks, I'm telling you, there is not a chance Jesus was going to do that. Then Jesus said to him, and by the way, the other thing, I had never thought of this before, but the other thing is, it it's almost seems like the devil was tempting him saying, hey, you won't have to go through the cross. Think about this. There won't be suffering. There won't be death. You won't, uh, you know, walk. You won't carry that cross if you'll just bow down. And of course, Satan was a liar, <clears throat> and we knew that wasn't going to happen. But folks, let me tell you this. There's no shortcuts to walking with God. There's no shortcuts. Man, you got to be on His road. You got to be reading His Word. You got to be aware of what's going on around you. And folks, as Steve mentioned, I'm telling you, He's throwing that, those darts at us every day. Haven't you figured out why people that annoy you still annoy you? <laughs> Haven't you figured that out? because you have not made peace with God. And with that, get right with God, folks, in every area. And again, we're not perfect. We're not perfect. But I'm simply saying, you know, it is written. Look what he's saying. Uh, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Deuteronomy 6.13 says that. And then, it's, then it says, then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered him. Let me ask you a question. 
Which would you rather have? The devil's food or angel's food? <laughs> I've always asked myself, why do we call eggs deviled eggs? Can we change that at our church? Angel eggs. I don't want devil's food. <laughs> all right? I know I'm getting picky here, but that's always bothered me. Okay? Now I feel better. <laughs> the devil left him, and angels came and ministered to him. Oh, folks, James 1, and I close. I know we're getting close. James chapter 1. Blessed is, verse 12, James 1, 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Folks, it's coming. You're going to be tempted tomorrow. You're going to be tempted this afternoon of some kind. You're going to be tempted. When he has approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them who love them. Folks, when it's all said and done, we're going to live forever with Jesus. Now that's a good deal. That's a great thing. Let no one say well, he is tempted. I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God's never tempted you. You know what God does? He tests us. But that's totally different from tempting us with sin. If it's sin, it's coming from the devil. You need to know that. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Enticed means baited, okay? I mean, who fishes uh, with a cork and a hook and no bait on it? Nobody in their right mind does. What does entice mean? He lures you to that. And folks, I'm telling you, he likes to make wrong right and right wrong. He likes to just dangle these things that, that are precious to you in front of you when it could really be exactly opposite in, in the results. If you do this, it could be a disaster. It could, it could be a disaster to your marriage. It could be a disaster to your finances. It could be a disaster to your children. I hope we understand our sin affects others around us. I'm telling you, if for some crazy reason, this week, I get on my motorcycle and for some crazy reason, I was intoxicated when I did that. You are not going to come here and listen to me next Sunday. You're going to say, what in the world happened to our preacher? And folks, I am telling you, if we could see the end results of a lot of these situations, we would have never done it. But Satan is sneaky. He's sneaky. He's the king of all liars. And I'm telling you, we take the bait and we fall. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. You think, I could sin and uh, folks, there is a sin unto death. Okay, read 1 John chapter 4. You, as a result of the decision that you made, you could literally lose your life. And not only that, but to become calloused to sin. And folks, we know what callous means. If I took a hot iron and I, I burned myself the first time, it would hurt. The second time, it would hurt. But when I did it the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth time on the same place, it would have built up that. I would become calloused to that, whereas eventually I could burn myself and it not even bother me. Folks, I don't want to get calloused to the Lord. I want to keep my heart and my mind and my body and my life open to His will. And the last one, 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you, it's such as common to man. Hey, it's not new for you folks. It's already been happening. I mean, you look at our world, uh, can I mention Sodom and Gomorrah? Folks, there's nothing new under the sun, Ecclesiastes tells us. Sin is sin, lies are lies, the devil's the devil. He's just doing it in a different way and it's escalating right now. All right, our world is messed up with sin. But God is faithful. 
who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Folks, God's not going to hang you out to dry. All right? God is going to be there with you. And here's the key, folks. Do the right thing the first time. Do the right thing, because there are consequences to everything we do. Let me, su- let me uh, sum this up. Number one, walk in the Spirit. You want victory over temptation, walk in the Spirit. Number two, quote Scripture. Number three, pray in the Spirit. Number four, surrender your will. What did Jesus say? Not my will, Lord, but thine be done. He knew what the cross was like. He knew what he was going to go through. And when he had prayed and prayed and prayed, he says, God, you have me totally. God, I am going to do what you tell me to do. I am going to fulfill the will of God. And number five, totally trust God. Father, thank you for the day. And God, I know temptation is all around us. God, I just know that every day we are thrown those fiery darts. God, I pray that we would just understand that Jesus went through this for us. Jesus was tempted by Satan itself. Jesus spent 40 days fasting and Uh, Lord, I know he spent much time with you. And God, I know Satan was just hammering him. God, I thank you that three times he said no to temptation. And God, I pray that you would help us to wake up in the spirit, to walk in the spirit, and to please you in everything we do. God, help us to be able to recognize temptation. And God, I pray, Lord, that we would just say no to temptation. God, I pray that you would give the Christian that power, that dunamis, that ability to just say no. And God, I pray, even when we do fail, God, I thank you that you forgive us. Lord, sometimes you don't stop the consequences, though. We have to pay the bill. But God, thank you that you love us and you give us salvation. So God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, that cannot honestly say if they died today, they would go to heaven. God, I pray they'd come down today. I pray they'd just give their heart and their life to Jesus. Others may need to rededicate their life or come for baptism. Or Lord, join this church. Whatever you tell them to do, God, I pray they would do it. And God, we'll be careful to give you the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?